I am uh, Ashwini Deshpande uh, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome uh, two extraordinary writers, Sabha Diwan and Namita Devi Dayal. Uh, their recent books, uh, Sabha's Tawayaf Nama and Namita's The Sixth String of the Vilayat Khan, are informative, fascinating and unputdownable. Uh, what is, I thought was remarkable about these books uh, is that they've been written by uh, two individuals who are actually outside the world of music. So Sabha is a documentary filmmaker, Namita uh, is a journalist, but, uh, and also the author of, by the way, another excellent book called The Music Room, which you should read uh, when you get a chance. But for the purpose of these books, they have entered the worlds of their protagonists. So they are both present inside their books. And it, being actors and characters inside the books, they take us on this journey with them inside. And so they are temporary insiders. And that gives these books a certain feel, a certain, uh, uh, you know, a certain atmosphere that takes the readers along on this journey. And we learn about you know, society of, of their respective protagonists, customs, prejudices, structures of power uh, that recognize and value artistic talent or not sometimes. Uh, so they, they play in both ways and we learn all of these things through their books and um, also learn how success is very seldom unidimensional. So, you know, even the successful individuals in the book have uh, aspects to their personality that are uh, gray or dark, you know, and so it gives, uh, it, it give, takes us into this beautiful journey and it's to the credit of these two writers that um, the way in which they write, we make these, it's almost as appears as if we are making these discoveries along with them. So it's at the same moment that they discovered something, that's when we the readers also discover it. So we unravel mysteries, we learn about people, we learn about personalities, we learn about customs. Uh, Sabah's book is a fascinating social history, you know, uh, going over say six or seven generations. Uh, so that's, that's what these books are about. And uh, I have several questions to both of them. Your respective protagonists um, occupy very different positions in the world of Hindustani art music. Sabha, your protagonist is anonymous. We never learn who she is. Whereas Namita, yours is a Goliath, a superstar, uh, distinguished lineage, trailblazer, uh, innovator with heirs and students. So he's a very, very public figure as opposed to your protagonist who's, who remains anonymous. Um, what were the factors that led each of you to choose these individuals as your subjects? Uh, you yourself have been a student of vocal music, so why did you choose an instrumentalist and why Vilayat Khan? And Saba, from your book, it seems like yours was a really long journey, about 17 years or so, you've been meeting with the families. Um, and you talk in the first few pages about how it was serendipity that uh, you met the particular protagonist. But you mentioned several times in the book that you went to meet other Tawaya families. Why is it that this particular story was chosen? Is it because it was a more interesting one? Is it because they were willing to talk to you more? Or uh, is there a higher explanation? So basically, I want to learn from both of you about the making of your books. Um, you know, it's funny because uh, I did not seek out this book, uh, it kind of came to me and um, it's because Vilad Khan's younger son Hidayat was uh, very keen that, I think many things, one is that uh, for the for the larger music uh, world outside just the music world, uh, sitar is synonymous with Ravi Shankar and you know Vilayat Khan has sort of been um, um, well, a little bit in the shadows of Ravi Shankar. Um, and I think that uh, that's, that's a whole other sort of narrative which I won't go into and it's because of the, the fact that Ravi Shankar was internationally collaborative, etc., with so many artists. But, um, you know, he, he the, so there were two things. One is that he felt that Vilayat Khan hadn't been sort of given his due recognition for a larger mainstream audience. And the second was that the man himself was so extraordinarily interesting 
that, um, and, and very relevant to him as a musician, that he felt that that needed to come out, uh, and, and just all the stories that surrounded him, his, his, like his imagination, his, um, you know, ability, his discerning nuance for all the finer things in life which reflected in his music, and the whole sort of parallel between his life, his music, his taste, his, you know, ability to sort of like turn color into music, etc., were things that he just felt needed to be talked about. And he had grown up listening to all this, and he just felt like, you know, so that's how it came to me. And the reason I agreed to do this book was because <clears throat> in most of these people's lives, you really, there's very little archival information. And so you're basically relying on um, <clears throat> people who are close to them and, you know, students, um, family, uh, ex-lovers, ex-wives, whatever, the whole sort of gamut of like their vet, whatever, who, anyone who's had anything to do with them. And you have to really sort of do journalistic work, detective work to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And because I did have access to his sons, both Shajat and Hidayat, his most close student, who was Arvind Bhai Parikh, um, and various other people, that's the only reason I agreed to do it. So I've had a whole bunch of musicians and their families come to me and say, kuch karo, but until you have this kind of like close, intimate access, where you know that, you know, you're gonna get the stories that otherwise wouldn't get out there, you, you can't do these kinds of projects, it's impossible because there's nothing you're relying on except um, oral, oral narratives. Uh, so that's, that's how it's happened. And, and even within that, there's so many lies that you have to listen to three versions of the same story from the same, you know, about the same thing, and then really use your own um, sort of gut feel uh, to, to glean out the, the correct one, you know. And, and fully know that you're chasing a hologram. Well, in my case, actually, the thing was that I heard the same story related in the context of three different people. And the same story. Yeah, yeah. So it, it works like that. Okay. You know, these are these apocryphal stories about, you know, the Tawaif who goes out on this horse-drawn carriage. Right. In this, uh, you know, in, through the area which is barred to Indians. Mm -hmm. It's a very favorite story, which... Uh, I, you hear it in the context of Goharjan, and then you hear it in the context of Benazir Bai. I mean, you know, any of the big Tawaifs, uh, legendary Tawaifs of that particular city, that story gets told about them. So, th so the point is actually then to start reading within what the story is trying to say, yeah. rather than whether, you know, whether it is true or false, or who really does it talk about, because that's not really the important part of that uh, story. Uh, I started work uh, on the Tawaifs, you know, through uh, my film actually, uh, way back in 2000, 2001. And um, I guess because I worked, uh, you know, most of my work has been around issues related to gender, sexuality, and uh, also issues uh, of identity, identity politics and culture. So I was interested uh, in looking at Tawaifs, but it took me long. I mean, it just took very long to, uh, to actually convince people to be part of the project. And understandably so, because, uh, you know, I mean, it's the, 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 the community as a whole has just faced so much stigmatization and has been so marginalized that, um, I mean, no one really wants to identify themselves. Forget about the families, even the accompanist musicians. You know, I was told, never ask, a, you know, a tabla player or a sarangi player directly whether they've played with baijis. Mm -hmm. It's very rude to say so. So, you know, I, it was actually my first learning in, in this whole trip, in this whole research journey, was to learn to speak in these elaborate euphemisms. Mm -hmm. We all knew what we were talking about, but it was never said. We spoke in these euphemisms and whether they knew of someone of the great guy cast Gane Wali mm -hmm. and then you just say Gane Wali Beach Me. So, you know, and of course, it's not that did they play, but did someone they know play? So, that kind of thing. So, understandably, through all this, you know, it's like a shadow dancing thing we went on. It took time, it took very long. Mm -hmm. But I think the fact was that the the mod, you know, the, the fact that it was so difficult to access people 
who were willing to talk actually was became the real reason mm -hmm. for me to carry on because it just meant that there's something so unspeakable almost and there's just so much hidden that you know we that, so because when when things are hidden the way they are or invisibilized then there's something one must be something which the stakes of hiding must be quite high too yeah. so and i think that was the reason that really uh, spurred me on uh, over the years uh, i did meet with a lot of eventually i mean of course over the over the years i was able to uh, you know meet with a lot of families the wife families and uh, also build relationships of trust and friendship uh, that, that was very important they had to trust me and um, with them with their stories for them to be able to open themselves and the first part was the more difficult part which was the making of the film for them to be on camera so once uh, that was done you know then to be in the book now but the book actually i thought it would be easier but it wasn't one thing is that how do you tell the stories of people who are still living you know i mean biographies about dead people i think are easier written uh, they are not going to be there to clobber you and you know hopefully uh, one can be honest without hurting too many feelings but here it's not about hurting feelings i mean here there was a certain kind of i knew that i had great responsibility over me uh, about this community and I, i wanted to tell uh, the their life stories represent them you know truly but without compromising upon you know their privacy their sense of identity it was actually the toughest thing uh, as and as a first time writer i mean i was like oh bloody hell how do i deal with this so fine i mean the thing was i changed names but changing names was not good enough because people who knew these families would be able to identify them so to answer your question yes the main protagonist uh it just clicked i we got along i actually had you know have lots of friends and we were i i talked to all of them and their stories are all there she is there as a moving spirit because i felt that there was a story here that i really wanted to share and it's also the story of a relationship between uh you know myself and her you know a middle class woman and this tawal uh and i i it it came the you know it came like naturally to me to tell this story um but what i was also doing really was to make composite characters so you know these are not stories of say one mm. fixed person uh the stories are themselves my whole endeavor was to be true to those stories mm. the stories as they are told is how they were told to me and also to find connections within those stories the context in you know and to try to understand those stories within a larger you know political social cultural context so that as a writer i was i was trying to do uh but i was also actually you know it once i decided that okay i'm going to change the names and i'm going to actually blur identities then actually i i started almost enjoying it because in a way this was this was a territory which is not fiction but it's not entirely biographical so i i was treading on a ground which i just did i mean you know i don't know how well but so that's how it worked well i mean as you know uh, the point when uh, namita stopped is a lot of your material as you say it's you know for both of you it's come from conversations in your case there's been some published material obviously not so much in your case other than the historical uh, uh, accounts that you uh, refer to and what you've both done excellently is actually interwoven these narratives these stories these different versions of the same event uh, with your imagination and so your both your books read like uh, like a like a continuous flowing narrative you know it's like a story it's as if this is all happened and we were all there a uh, part of sada bahar's life a part of you know pyari khala's life and all of those things so that's you know hats off to both of you uh, as uh, you know on your writing skills but uh, so about to come to your book uh, you 
by the time you we reach the protagonist's mother's life, you know, it's several generations, the story goes through several generations, and the closer that the story comes to present day, the closer that it comes to the lives of the people who are actually telling you these incidents, I felt as a reader that the tone shifted. Uh, it became more dark, it, be it had rough edges, it had shades of grey, compared to the earlier the accounts of the earlier generation Tawaiyafs, which was all this, you know, sadak pe nikalti thi, to dil toot jate the, you know, things like that, you know, these legendary stories. Compared to that, then you want to come to Tima and, and other people, you start to see the areas of vulnerability, uh, the, you know, mixed sort of agency, some agency in some spheres, but not so, so much others. Uh, is it just the fact that the more recent accounts are the actually remembered accounts as opposed to the earlier accounts that were sort of these legendary accounts. And I guess it's the same question for you as well, which is, you know, in, in, in musician families, you always hear that they used to do 36 hours of the water. They didn't even get water. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, that's, you know, but th there are these legends and myths associated with, with ancestors. And so, you know, how did you, I mean, you've talked about this a little bit, but uh, is it that the grit and the uh, and the dark edges were always there, but they're not so remembered in the earlier accounts? You know, I mean, they, I think it is also in terms of the way these families are looking at these stories. This particular family, these are precious heirlooms, like these stories of Dharman and Sadabahar. And these are those stories which they hold on to. And their telling is, I think, um, is guided by that um, or molded by that that in the face of all the stigma and shame mm. these are this is of a time before mm. so uh, and so they you know it's like when we were like this mm. uh, but of course actually if you look at even uh, um, you know Sadabahar story mm. uh, Dharman story also ends actually in the sense of you know she just disappears uh, in uh, the you know in the in the war of 1857 not recognized not remembered nothing mm -hmm. and actually for that matter even Sadabahar who is the most celebrated uh, musician of this family and they really like okay Sadabahar you know all these fantastic mm -hmm. stories mm -hmm. the fact is that Sadabahar is also a cautionary tale mm -hmm. because Sadabahar's music is so uh, other it's so beautiful it's otherworldly and there's a danger to that because then you can be lost to the real world mm -hmm. and that i think it should be seen in the context of gender really in this in the thing of tawaifs because they had to be in this world they were earning for their families mm -hmm. so you know your music could be otherworldly only to a certain extent <laughs> otherwise and that is the Sadabahar after all ultimately what happens she 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 becomes she loses her own voice and she becomes a medium for uh, the Sufi uh, uh, saint in whose dargah she spends all her time after that so so you know so it's actually it's not as if the dark edges are not there uh, they are there but when we as we come closer to the telling of the tales now these are the stories a i think they have to be seen in the context also of nationalism you know and and the kind of uh, ways in which nationalism uh, of all hues nationalists of all hues were impacting uh, upon uh, the tawaif's lives and um, and I think that made a big difference. I think it's also when it, these are closer stories. I mean, these are of just about a one generation away, or two generations away. So uh, these are lived out stories. And, uh, and therefore, the way they are told, they had a different quality, uh, you know. So I- Thinking that along these lines, um, so, you know, one of my favorite quotes is Marquez who says that, charitable deceptions of selective nostalgia, mm -hmm. which we all suffer from as individuals because that's how we survive. But in the case of a lot of these artists, I think it was amplified to another level where they were just fully fantasizing about all kinds of things, co-opting stories from here and there. And <clears throat> Ajita, my, uh, the editor on this book, actually reminded me about a story which Vilayat Khan had made up about how these dakus <coughs> found him somewhere and then 
tried to plunder from him but he said I have nothing but my instruments so then he played for them and so then instead of taking anything from him they were so moved that they gave him a ruby ring and that same exact story I had completely forgotten was in the music room in the voice of Aladia Khan and she reminded me of that and she sh she pointed at the pages and, and I've heard this from Tamayas <laughs> I'm just like, that is so horrifying, you know, to think. That's what I'm saying, the same stories travel, you know. Yeah, and so, and in his case, you know, uh, somebody who was very close to him said ki, wo to kabhi kabhi galti se sach bol de te te. <laughs> you say that? Yeah, and so to think that, you know, you can't even count on the protagonist for the real stories is like extraordinary, right? So you have to then sort of like, I think, just know that A, as a storyteller, you're already once removed. B, the person is also removed from himself or herself. And C, you know, what is the intent of a book like this yes. is the point that you were making. And I think that's very relevant. So the intent is, I mean, there's no dearth, at least in his case and many other musicians, of salacious tales. I mean, it was like this this man was just crazy. Like, me too would not, you know, like, we don't even want to go there, right? So, um, so the point is that what are you trying to do? Are you trying to tell, like, a really gossipy, um, you know, story about this, like, really attractive, amazing musician? Or are you trying to do something more, which is touch on both that world, zoom out into that period, um, and for me, above all, also bring out his frailties as a man and be okay with it in a non-judgmental way. Yes. Because, you know, in India, we tend to put everyone on a pedestal, yes. and, and like if they're, you know, if they're like a Khansai or a Pandit, so it's like, it's just fully, you know. Hagiographies. Hey, Hagiographies. Hey, so, uh, you, you, to be able to do this, my intent was, uh, I forgot what your question was, but. Um, just No, so I, I guess it was to. Yeah, separating the apocryphal, but uh, the idea being it's fine for there to be these like mythologies in there, uh, but you have to sort of um, allow the reader to participate in the life of a genius who's also a human being and in his case you know the sons I was very lucky because both of them were very candid about the difficult times the the difficulty of being son uh, uh, the son of um, uh, of somebody like of uh, you know Vilayat Khan who's a self-absorbed megalomaniacal you know sort of uh, and they and so to me that was really lovely because his stories about his father and grandfather etc were full of those you know Charlie's Kante Ka Chilla and all that stuff and the sons were like, dude, it was tough, you know? <laughs> I mean, really, and both of them are luckily sort of very, um, like, easygoing, yeah. nice people who kind of were open. And I could see, the, I could sense the pain, but within that, within that, there was also those moments of beauty where he, you know, they talk about, like, you get that one insight which can change your life, you know? You're sitting over there, and the father's telling you that, make sure that the colors of a sunset and a sunrise, which are different, come into your music. I mean, it's like something that, you know, changed my life when I heard that. You know, you sort of learn how to understand that the joy and the pain and the beauty and the horror all come together. And I think that I was trying to sort of just be okay with that, present the life of a genius, uh, with the intent of, of, of like saying that it's all okay. Just, you know, take what you have to from it kind of thing. And I always had my son in my head thinking that, you know, a kid needs to read about these people, understand the glory, also understand the craziness, and be okay with it. We do that with the Steve Jobs, right? We read about like him and say, oh, the guy was crazy, or he was like a genius, and it's all okay. But in India, you don't have too much of that. And it's really important, right?